mercy. To be talking about God's mercy. If God is not a merciful God, he wouldn't allow Penn State to beat Iowa last <laughs> Dave said, burr, 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 burr. <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious God, <laughs> thank you that you do <laughs> a lot of do-overs. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you are a God of, of forgiveness. And uh, Lord, time and again, all of us have come to you uh, with the messes of our lives and counted on you. You take us to that place where uh, we can't go any further and the next step is to see what you have to do. And we've done all the best we can. We come boldly to you looking to you for your solutions. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 My message is God mercy. Couldn't resist it. I love the passages for today. Because we have the passage of, you know, first off from the psalm. Psalm uh, speaks about God's mercy. We have the story from the gospel about mercy. We have the story from the Old Testament about uh, Jonah and Nineveh and God's mercy. And so it got me to thinking about a story, and I came across a story about um, God's mercy, and, and I believe it is does have its root in theology because uh, it goes like this. On their way to a justice of the peace to get married, a couple has a fatal car accident, and the couple is sitting outside Heaven's Gate waiting on St. Peter <coughs> to do an intake, and while waiting, they wonder if they could possibly get married in heaven. And St. Peter finally shows up and they ask him this very question, St. Peter, please have mercy on us. You know, I, we'd like to get married. We waited all this time to get married and, and now it just we don't know that we're going to be able to get married. Can, you know, uh, can we get married in heaven? And so St. Peter says, well, you know, I don't know. This is the first time anyone has ever asked. Let me go find out. I mean, so St. Peter leaves and the couple sits for a couple of months and begins to wonder if they really should get married in heaven. What with the eternal aspect of it and all, you know? You know, after all, what, what happens if it all doesn't work out? They wonder, are we stuck together forever? So St. Peter returns after yet another month, looking somewhat, you know, disheveled. <coughs> he comes up and he goes, well, he says, we can get it done. Yes, we, you know, you, you know, you can get married in heaven. Great, says the couple. But what if things don't work out? Could we also get a divorce in heaven? At this point, St. Peter, he's all red-faced. He slams down his clipboard onto the ground. What's wrong, exclaims the frightened couple. Come on, St. Peter exclaims. It took me three months to find a priest up here. <laughs> Do you have any idea how long it's going to take me to find a lawyer? <coughs> Mercy. We've been talking for the past couple weeks about... Operation Andrew. Operation Andrew is a prayer strategy. <coughs> of praying for seven people intentionally. And 
we had it, you know, a way of going about <coughs> and then the idea was to invite them to church events and worship. Why would we do such a thing? It's for that very reason. Mercy. For mercy. For mercy's sake. We want to see God move in their life. Yes, I want to see people invited to church. Yes, I want to see them come to church events. But more than anything, I want to see people reach with the power of the gospel. I want them to know that God is the God of infinite do-overs. I want them to know that God, our God is a God of righteousness and he's a God of mercy as well. For us not to share with people would, would, would be like holding something back in their hour of greatest need. Martin Luther would talk about that in you know among the commandments that if we if if you know if our, we see that our neighbor has need of something that we have and we don't share it with them that we're stealing from them aren't you gospel thieves that you would not pray for your these people on your list? Have I asked you to go one by one and read the Bible to them or to, to you know give them a four you know four spiritual law books? You remember when folks used to do that back in the 70s? Yep. Yeah, 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 I really am that old. <laughs> there was a time we used to hand out tracts, and you know, I was pretty young. Okay. I'm not as old as Vince, but I mean. <laughs> Actually, I think we're the same way. <laughs> All we've said is pray for folks and then invite them to come for bratwurst for Pete's sake. And we haven't even said we're going to, you know, somebody's going to be the beer police and check their cup when they come. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. That's it. We pray for people, then invite them to come to an event. And, and it's simple as that. I can't help but think about Jonah. Yeah, we love the story about Jonah. Anybody like this story about Jonah? I love this story about Jonah. They did Jonah up at Sight and Sound. They got the idea about Jonah, how to do sight and, uh, you know, Jonah had sight and sound from Disney, and the way Disney put it on. But uh, uh, they did a theatrical version of Jonah. You know, think about Jonah being called to Nineveh to go and speak to the Ninevites. So what's Jonah do? He catches the first boat going in the opposite direction. Right? <clears throat> Jonah's biggest problem wasn't just the fear of the Ninevites. Let me put some things in perspective. When we think of ISIS and we think of what they're doing or what they have done, to the Christians in Egypt. Bring back pictures in your mind. Amen? That was the Ninevites. That's what those folks were doing. That's what they were doing to Jews. That's what they were like. And now God wants him to go to Nineveh? First, he's got to overcome his own prejudice, his own hatred to go and to go and speak to them. 
And so he's going to overcome that. But he goes and he does speak to them. According to our first lesson, he does go and speak to them. But then he's, I think, secretly hoping maybe they won't repent. He goes through and, and he, you know, he says, you know, three more days. And, you know, if you don't repent, God's going to smoke the place. God is going to nuke you till you glow. How's that? See, he likes that. In fact, jo Jonah even says, give me a front row seat, God, when you nuke Nineveh. And he's good with that, Paul. He's good with that, right? Amen. But what isn't he good with? What if there's an outside chance that God changes their heart. And they turn from their wickedness. And he spares them. What if he actually would do such a thing as to forgive people that kind of thing? I mean, that would just be totally crazy, wouldn't it? Saddam Hussein? Osama bin Laden. I mean, can I stir up a little bit of anger here? Would God do that kind of thing? How about Saul of Tarsus? Does that put it in perspective? Saul becomes Paul. See, judgment he can handle. And you and I can as well. Because we don't lack for that, right? Because we've lived under it. At some point or another, we've lived under the tyranny of being judged or being accepted. Of being rejected and knowing the pain and the anger and the symptoms that go along with that, right? Or, on the other side, the pats and the strokes and everything that goes along with that. It's a tyranny of those two that go together. It's a hard thing to reconcile. Sometimes, maybe I'll have a chance to preach on deliverance from a spirit of rejection. Maybe you've known it. Well, anyway, judgment Jonah can handle. See, that's a heart issue. Mercy? Mercy? Now, that's just plain hitting below the belt. What if it gets out that mercy triumphs over judgment? I mean, we can't just have people getting that in their head that God's actually a merciful God, can we? I mean, especially if it got out of here. That God actually is a merciful God and loves people with a twinkle in his eye and with open arms. Warts and all. Even from the very beginning, regardless of what they're doing. You see, mercy was the most primitive rule of law at creation. Write this down. This is good stuff. In fact, I already did. Mercy was the most primitive rule of law at creation. Mercy means loving kindness. It ruled the day in the garden. You see it, God creates out of mercy. And you get an understanding of that God comes tiptoeing through the garden. Because God is a merciful God and just wants to spend time with his peeps. Can't you just hear that? Adam. Eve, 
it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> Are you speaking my language yet? It's toddy time. He wants to have time with them. Why? See, he wants to bring them so that he can slap them around a little bit. Tell them what they didn't do. No. I mean, when God first went looking for Adam and Eve in the garden, it wasn't so he called them out on the carpet. It was because he realized he, he wanted to have that time with him, with them. And he was missing that time. In fact, you know what? It goes even further back. This concept of mercy towards sinners. It goes back even farther before creation. In fact, get your Bible open and go with me to Revelation 13, verse 8. That's it. Ooh, yeah. You know, that thing in front of you. Let's hear the wonderful sounds of angels playing. Get that Bible out. Revelation 13, 8. Revelation 13, 8. Here we are in the courts of heaven. God's mercy towards sinners wasn't just at creation. Okay, you there? Mm -hmm. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Slain from when? Foundation. From the what? what? The from the foundation of the world. That means even before creation, God already had it in his mind. Okay, what if people sin? What is in plan to be able to address that sin? God already put it in place already put that plan in place even before Adam and Eve had taken a bite of apple. He had already, guess what? He had already put a way <laughs> back. He already had that in his mind. Are you getting that? You ever noticed that before? He already had it in his mind. You see, God loves to extend mercy. But I got to tell you, our mercy goes so far. Our mercy really does. We treat mercy like a currency. Have you ever noticed that? We treat mercy like a currency. In other words, you know, hey, jo Jody, you, you cut me some mercy, I'll cut you some mercy. Fine. You know, you cut me some slack, Mercy, I'll cut you some, right? So in other words, we got this kind of exchange kind of, of mercy going on between us. But God's mercy is so much bigger and so much more powerful where our mercy is kind of like that currency. God's mercy is rooted to his character. And guess what? He looks for it in us. In fact, he looks for it so much that he says in Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? <coughs> to like mercy? Maybe be remotely? Acquainted to mercy. Yeah, mercy is my next door. I once in a while pass by, I wave to him. Hey! 
Surely goodness and mercy. <laughs> shall follow me all the days of my life. Mercy. We like mercy when we get it from God. Amen? Amen. Especially when we know we deserve judgment. But when it comes to extending it to others who don't deserve it. <clears throat> suddenly we can turn into a scrooge. Or maybe I'm just speaking to my own heart. Come on, am I own, the only one being honest here? Or how about this one? Verily I say unto thee, thou hast heard it said of old. Behold, I am not being fed in this pasture any longer. Thus I shall go to another that I may be fully fed. You ever heard that one? Guess what? It's entirely possible that folks don't buy a culture lacking in mercy. You see, a pastor is one person affecting so much change at one time. And folks thrive in a culture that is filled with grace and mercy. <clears throat> not harshness, not judgment. We also have to consider the amount of mercy that we extend to each other. And I really think this is rich. We gotta stop and think for a minute. How much mercy do we extend to each other? Do we run ourselves ragged with our church schedule? Do we burn ourselves out with activities as great as they might be? Do you ever find yourself getting overheated? The past two weeks, I taught this simple process of prayer. Paul <laughs> prayed this way, very simply. He said that the God, look, turn with me, Ephesians 1, verses 17 and 18. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what Paul is praying for his listeners. And here's a great prayer. This is the prayer that Paul is praying. We can pray this for the folks on our list as well. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, that your eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So we come to open, that our eyes are open. And then God wants people not just to come to know his salvation, but God wants people to get connected. Because Christians without a congregation are called orphans. When I see the way that, you know, over the past couple of weeks, when we had a loss in the congregation, and I saw how our small group was able to just be there in that time of need, and our congregation as a whole to be there in the time of need. What if there, I mean, it happens all the time. People <coughs> go through those times of losses, and they don't have anybody. They don't have a pastor. They don't have a church. They don't have a small group. What is a Christian without a congregation? It's an, you know, it's an orphan. What a blessing to have that connection. Turn with me real quick. Psalm 68, verse 6. Because I want you to see this for yourself. <coughs>
It's good to have a church family. The word says, are you there? Okay. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. What's that mean? <coughs> God sets the solitary in families. So in other words, if you don't have a congregation, a church family, you're alone. But God's answer to that is to be connected to a church, to a congregation, to a family, a church family. That's God's answer. And then he goes, you know, the, the psalmist goes on to say, he brings out those who are bound into prosperity. Now, what's that mean? He bring, brings out those who are bound into prosperity. Basically, if you are together, you're going to prosper, and you're much better when you're together than when you're out there by yourself trying to do life on your own. I don't care if you're part of a SEAL team or whatever you're part of. You come to know pretty quickly that you're much better when you're out there as a unit. You're going through life as a unit and you have a connection. But if you're just out there, maverick, you know, you know me on my, you know, me my white horse and riding around in high hose soaps, right? See, that's God's solution, is to be connected to a congregation, a church family, and that we should do life together because we prosper much more. We share together, we share in each other's joys, and we also care for each other in our burdens as well. We are never poor when we have each other and we have those relationships. What a great, what a great insight! But let's, don't stop there. What's, what's the word say? But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. What's that mean? Take a look. Well, the prodigal son goes off. Everything looks good. He's eaten high on the hog there for a while. But what a great story of God's once again mercy. See, when he's out there, things get dry pretty quickly because what's the psalm say the rebellious dwell in a dry land <laughs> you ever been going in a direction that was apart from God and what God wanted you to you'd do you know going 85 miles in the opposite direction of what God wanted you to do and you're coming to realize <laughs> it's like whoa things are just not going right here it's getting pretty dry I'm beginning to wonder, am I going the right direction? Am I on the right track? So you, you turn around and say you know, something, because, hey, maybe I'm going the wrong direction. Well, it's because the rebellious dwell on a dry land. What a, what a great thing. God intends for us to be together. God doesn't like rebellion. In fact, God puts it in his own word in Sam, 1 Samuel 15, 23. Write this down. 1 Samuel 15, 23. God's really clear about this. The, you know, God's message to King Saul. He says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Answer. Psalm 68 6. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell on a dry land. Oh, that sounds like a mean, horrible God, doesn't it? Really full of judgment. No, it's a merciful verse. That's what God's intention is. Let's pray.
Gracious Lord, thank you so much. You are a God of mercy. You're full of compassion. And you, you are a God of righteousness. Lord, continue. Allow us to turn to your word. Lead us and guide us in all things. In your name.